you do it. Okay, welcome to the MMU Philosophy Society podcast. Uh, today we've got Sam Alexander to talk about his essay. Uh, what was the title of the essay again? I've got it up here. Something like, what, how was the death of God philosophically significant or something like that? Re- reflect on the philosophical significance of Nietzsche's claim that God is dead. There you go, yeah. It wasn't that impressive. Far. It was a good title. Uh, yeah. So what, what unit were you doing when you were writing this essay? Uh, it was Nietzsche and Sartre module. Which is, uh, that was definitely my favorite module this year. Mm. I didn't do that one. Ah, it's a shame. It's um, that's like all like the sexy philosophy, you know, like the existentialist sort of like smoke a cigar and like ponder philosophy. You know what I mean? Wants mm-hmm. to be the healthy pool. <laughs> yeah, I'm doing Heidegger next year. I think. Oh, Heidegger! I've, I kind of, I'm intrigued by Heidegger, but like I've heard he's like a bastard to read. Mm. like sort of like similar to Hegel and Kant in terms of just like ah uh, what are you actually even saying <laughs> I didn't find him that bad but I only read the first few pages of being in time and like right. the, the guy who taught him Husserl I read his book and that was just incomprehensible you know like it was really terrible that. <laughs> <laughs> I've, he's the phenomenologist isn't he mm-hmm. I've heard he's quite worthy it was just so obtuse it was just it, it, it started to become like not acceptable you know like he needs to improve his writing you know <laughs> yeah it, it, people are too scared to tell like these sort of elite academic philosophers in throughout history that they like write like mm. awfully you shouldn't have to go and like listen to some postgraduate do like a video essay to explain something to you that like you know like you should be able to explain in his own book what he's on about you know <laughs> i agree 100 percent. yeah I, mean, I don't get it because surely would have wanted to talk to people, you know, like surely these, like, you know, intellectuals want to be able to exchange their ideas with other people. Like surely the more people they can exchange it with, the better. So why yeah. just talk in such an incomprehensible way? Definitely. Well, I, I know Schopenhauer, like, in, like he, there's like this brilliant insult that he threw at Hegel. He described him as a flat-headed, insipid charlatan who's basically just like like ponder into a bunch of like dumbass students who like want to think the dead clever because he writes like an idiot <laughs> but his his point was basically that he just writes that bad on purpose so people can like think of him as some sort of like genius that you just don't get I mean, this is your opportunity to express what you mean in your essay to a wider audience yeah exactly like i'm pretty sure like i always find i end up just sounding really poncy whenever i write an essay so what was the what was the thrust of your essay? What was the give us the overview? So I think my main point was basically that throughout the history of Western philosophy, it's built upon this structure of this relationship between being and becoming, and what being and becoming essentially is is just a relationship between like something that's fixed and something that's f- like fluid or transitory, and this relationship is basically it starts with plato because he he asserts that life is like this uh, i can't remember the phrase he he uses i think he describes it as like the twilight world of decay and for plato as the as a philosopher he he thinks this is like the biggest problem because he says well how how can we unify ourselves and live a life that's that's moral and proper without some form of universal grounding so this is where he postulates that there must be some fixed true world beyond this world of decay which we can basically um how should we say direct our lives and society towards in order to fulfill ourselves and feel liberated and when he comes to Nietzsche he basically recognizes this structure has like propagated itself throughout history and identifies that throughout history the strength of being as a philosophical reality has gradually declined and essentially how this relates to the death of God is that God, you can define it in terms of this of being and becoming as being the the most ultimate representation of being because God is eternity. He is like the how should we say? If you think of the true world as being, which is separate to life, what represents that better than God? Basically, so that's that's basically the kind of gist of the essay. So God emerged from a style of thinking in which reality is always the same it's fixed and god represents that worldview yeah basically like the the eternity of heaven 
in Christian theology is something which is derived from um, the philosophy of Plato. It's the, the, the idea of like this eternity in relation to this temporal world is, 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 is almost like a hierarchy where like life is effectively in, inferior to the eternity that exists outside of this world. And so as Platonism fell out of favor, eventually that resulted in, in God being an old idea that got relegated to the dustbin. <laughs> well, yeah, I think that's a good way to put it because there was a, a gradual trend throughout history of being becoming less and less viable effectively. So you can see it from Plato to Christianity. Plato's point is that it's only like the true philosopher, the man that dedicates themselves entirely to rationality and not to like the bodily passions. They're the only ones that can attain this true world effectively. Whereas with Christianity, it it kind of twists it to add this new moral dimension to it, where it's like, oh, well, you can you can be forgiveful and you can just basically pray to God and you can confess in order to attain this heavenly other world. And so throughout history, this other world is almost kind of like, how should we say, it's a telos. And what telos means is effectively like an end goal or a sort of like a, a meaning of sorts. It's basically, it's almost like if you imagine like your life as like a timeline and it's like it start, oh, wait, it starts here and then it ends with um, basically going to heaven or whatever, the, the afterlife. And then it's, I, I, what I say in the essay is basically like the main point where it starts to become questionable whether this being exists whatsoever or whether it at least has any relevance to human life is through Kant because Kant's transcendental idealism basically says that like space and time this world that we we see and interact with is is not the true world it's it's a world that we construct through our perception so we basically constantly interact with like a almost interface which is kind of underneath it is hidden it this this is this true world but of course that just leads you to say if we can't interact with this true world then how do we know what it is you can't describe the true world using phenomena so that's what Nietzsche says he says that the, the true world doesn't matter and that we should just forget about it more or less yeah that's like a very like basically like a, a, a simplified way of saying what Nietzsche was trying to argue with his philosophy because he basically, he realizes that God is, or at least God in the Christian guise is inherently related to being as this reality outside of life. So if he starts to think, well, this reality outside of life, it, it, it bears no meaning on our lives. Like we, it, 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 inter it doesn't interact with it. We can't, we can't say anything about it. So it's like, what's the point in it whatsoever? So that's why he says that Christianity is Platonism for the people because he's yeah. drawn that comparison. I, I, yeah, I do believe so, because even just um, there are loads of strange things in Plato that you actually can connect to Christian theology, like even the, the, the cave analogy where the, the sort of shackled prisoner, like, uh, I don't know whether I should explain it for anybody who doesn't know what it is, but go ahead. Yeah. So it's the cave analogy is just this famous story told by Plato of it's, it's, it's basically an allegory for how he how his philosophical worldview works, but that there are these three prisoners shackled in a cave, in a cave and all they ever see is silhouettes from a, a fire that's behind them. So they never really interact with the truth for, for all intents and purposes. All they see is these shadow sort of representations of a higher reality that exists behind them. But one day this prisoner breaks free and he escapes out the cave. And at first he's blinded by the light because it's just too overwhelming. He's never been in direct sunlight. So they're just, it's, it's, it's almost torture because they just don't understand what's happening to them. But once they adjust to the light, they start to see what was actually cast in those shadows in the first place. And this is the most profound realization because it's like, oh, wow, this world that I interacted with was just a pathetic shadow world. There was something so much more profound behind me the entire time. And I forgot how, yeah, that's it. So relating this to Christianity, it's it's really interesting how profound light is as an analogy for truth, because that's something that like, um, obviously like the, the first utterance that God says is like, let there be light, which is basically like the logos. 
and it's, it's really interesting when you see how intertwined light is throughout christian theology as like being like the path towards the heavens or towards god so yeah so what we're left with for nietzsche is just no true world and just a kind of shimmer and shadow world of, a, of eternal flux kind of thing basically yeah and this is works in the essay it's asking what what's philosophically significant about pardon me about the death of god which is why i have to go through like the whole like rigmarole of explaining the history of like like the western like philosophical canon but the the point is that now that this true world has vanished it's it leaves us in a state where we're like we don't have this t loss anymore we don't have like this end goal to drive us and direct us in life it's just we're kind of stuck with this like world that has no meaning has no end goal it's just constantly doing its own thing and will do it for eternity so in a sense it's almost like a harrowing realization for an inherently christian society because it's like everything we thought we were doing everything we were like directing ourselves towards is now effectively an illusion so (laughs) yeah and that was the problem that heidegger wrestled with with wasn't it where he was he was saying that we need some kind of new great art to found a new like cultural narrative or something yeah yeah I, I in all honesty i don't really know like i've never read any heidegger but i know that heidegger makes a similar argument to what i make in this essay basically that like he almost says that philosophy ends with nietzsche because philosophy i think he as far as he's arguing starts with plato that the the goal of philosophy as having started from plato is essentially to find a fixed meaning in the world in order to kind of unify people so without the potential for this fixed meaning philosophy effectively almost just like malfunctions it doesn't really like do anything anymore i mean i'm not sure if i agree with that because you do say in the essay that metaphysics is over with with the the death of being Mm. and now that it's just becoming it's the end of metaphysics but couldn't think, you still ask the question that like what what is this bec- what is becoming yeah you know, like- i think what i mean by that is metaphysics in so far as it's begun with plato is something that doesn't really exist anymore because what that what the purpose of metaphysics <clears throat> is within that context like what what it's doing is effectively trying to find a universal meaning underlying um, reality it's um like i think it's oh what is it the there's i wanted to use the latin term for it to sound like smarter but it's called like the god's eye view the subspecies attorney that's it um which is effectively like when you can stand outside of life and look at it and like have an objective meaning like or like have an ob- objective worldview of um of, of reality that that basically kind of disappears but i i do agree with you i, I do think we can still have inquiry into the nature of reality on the predicate that reality is in of itself something which is temporal and transitory like um i mean if we can't figure out the ultimate nature if there's not no one you know becoming or there's not one you know being there still you know things found out about reality like even if it's not focused on one like you know one principle even if it's not like reality is god or reality is the form so we can still find out the nature of reality in fact you could argue that actually makes the inquiry a lot more interesting because we're trying to find out about all these different natures to reality Mm, definitely i mean i guess the issue is and i think this is what Nietzsche's really getting at is that you basically you can't really provide an explanation for anything anymore and this is where it, it ties into his perspectivism or which is effectively almost like a precursor to phenomenology because what he's basically saying is you, you can provide an explanation for something but that, that explanation is always going to have some degree of error involved it's always going to be it's it's always going to be a process so you can't really provide like an explanation has to be something which is resolute which is objective which stands against any other how should we say uh what's the word I'm trying to think how to explain it I've kind of just completely lost my track of thought now. Does that, <clears throat> does that tie into his rejection of uh, causality? Yeah, it, it, the, exactly. That's, yeah, that's, that's where I was going, actually. Because, um, for example, like, you know, I can, I can say something like, like, I have, like, this guitar pick in my hand and, like, I drop it. So you can explain that 
through causal events by saying like I I hold the pick, I let go of the pick, therefore the pick falls because of gravity or something along those lines. But this whole thing here, there's we can we can identify particular moments of this process where we say that thing happened and then that thing happened, but they're not, how should we say, they're not linked to each other with necessity because really what's happening here is a process. Like that pick technically keeps falling because, you know, gravity keeps pulling it down or whatever. So you can even say to yourself, well, when does it stop falling? Like, when did you really pick it up? And it's like, it's, it sounds almost like nitpicky, but you can't really get to like this moment, this causal component moment, which, leads to another moment it's almost like you know like dominoes fall on, on a chain that, that's not really how it works it's much more like water flowing through a river you can't you can't like pick up a bit of water and then the rest of the flow just kind of disappears or breaks off if that makes any sense you can't make hard delineations between events because they all flow into each other yeah that yeah very well put yeah that's exactly what i'm saying yeah hmm. So how does this relate to our identities? So that, like if the if reality is in constant flux, then who are we in this? Like what what in your opinion or in Nietzsche's opinion, like uh, do you have anything to say about human identity? Well, it's this is where perhaps Nietzsche doesn't go into as much detail as other philosophers do, I think. Uh, but because the reason why I did this essay was because I'm really interested in in Taoism, which has a lot of ties with like the philosophy of becoming like reality as being in flux and in in Taoism there is no real personal identity you are you are as much a process as water flowing down a lake or as much as the clouds are floating in the sky it's it, when you really internalize this idea that what reality is is just basically it's it, it's very comparable to water there's like in in Taoist text is always a lot of water analogies to come like to explain what reality is like um i've been reading the um there's a tech there's like a chapter in the in the shangzi that i've been reading recently that basically talks about like the the great autumn spring which is just basically like this infinite ocean that can do whatever it wants and it can go anywhere but it'll always it will always be streaming no matter what is basically just like an infinite source of this water in this great autumn spring and that really it really does recontextualize personal identity in that sense, because then you realize essentially like that you are just like this process that's always been doing itself. You, you can't, you can't with any certainty say that like when you, you're like when you were born and when you die, that's like the beginning and the end. If that makes any sense. So what but, you're saying is that reality is like a infinite ocean or an infinite river. Yeah. And everything that appears as a kind of pattern or like a current in the river. And yeah. So just like the clouds and the trees and all that are, are patterns, your thoughts and your feelings and and all that are just patterns in this river of. So would you say that that river is the mind or perception or what would you say that the river is made of? I uh, see. I I just like the word Dao. It kind of it keeps the mystery of what it is because I, I don't know whether I could ever describe well the one of the like the, the very first line of the Tao Te Ching is the Tao that can be Tao is not the eternal Tao which basically means that this word that we what this word that we use Tao to explain what reality actually is is not what reality actually is effectively it's almost like I think of it as like a linguistic concession it's basically like saying like if we've got to use a word we'll use that word but otherwise like that don't let that trick you that's not what the thing is if that makes any sense um correct me if i'm wrong but um could it be like a precursor to metaphysical skepticism in that you know it's saying that there is no one nature and two reality it's just Tao. we don't know what it is we can never know what it is it's just Tao. it's just this placeholder term for something yeah i, I yes yeah, so i suppose so because to know something would mean to be able to articulate it with limited concepts and that to, to the Taoists and very much um, in line with what Nietzsche is saying. It's like, that doesn't make any sense because, because how can you just take these little parts from something infinite and then say, oh, look, that's the thing. It's like, well, that doesn't make any sense. Infinity is huge. You can't ever summarize it. That's just, it's completely impossible. Um, also speaking of um, 
<clears throat> the whole like you know it, there's no one fixed metaphysical thing or how it all relates to being um, could you argue therefore that Nietzschean thought was a precursor to existentialism or that he is the first existentialist yeah it's it does seem that Nietzsche had a profound influence on the existentialists that came after them pardon me because Sartre as well talks a bit about how reality is like this becoming and see this is this is actually what I want to do my dissertation on which is basically like the the link between existentialism and Taoism because Sartre also wants to collapse the subject object distinction and want he wants to describe reality as something which is ontologically phenomenological which is which is basically a way of saying that like all that there is is consciousness and then things just appear within consciousness that's that's effectively what Sartre is saying but he's I feel like he's kind of constrained by his naturalistic worldview which means he doesn't really want to go how should we say down the mystical rabbit hole he wants to kind of stop it at a point and not like go further and I I really do think that if he went further with it he could maybe have come to like a really profound Mm. realization similar to Taoism but then again I'm not fully read most of Sartre's work yet so that's what do you mean by uh, naturalistic in that context so naturalistic as in essentially like atheistic or materialistic so that the world accords to natural laws Mm -hmm. if that makes any sense I think that's right I'm um I have to like double check now I sometimes use words without being a thousand percent sure what they mean I understood naturalism to be that you thought that everything could be explained through science yeah that's, that's it yeah basically yeah so the idea that like natural laws and forces govern the universe mm. but um, natural laws that's an interesting thing in itself you know because you mentioned the logos before like the idea that there could be like natural laws like over and above reality determining reality you know it's reminiscent of god evoking evoking reality through the word you know mm. like there's these kind of linguistic constructs laws which you know, like what? What would the law? How would the law exist in itself? You know, let's say. Yeah, I know what you mean. I think it's. I think that line of thinking is very much a Platonic thing and not a Nietzschean thing, because effectively, I I do genuinely believe that like if Plato was alive today, he would very much be like a scientific, um, scientific realist. Maybe I don't really know whether that's like the correct term but the point basically being that like there is such a thing as like the laws of physics and that like mathematics is something out there and not something that we project onto the world that we are ourselves deriving from like this sort of perfect harmonious world in order to explain our sort of muddled up imperfect world so there are purely abstract laws which exist in some kind of perfect realm which determine the behavior of uh the the our reality yeah yeah that's exactly it that's somewhere in outside of our life there is almost how should we say a form of maths so anytime you come across something because because i do think about this myself i think it is so peculiar just how profound maths is like how well it works like how we can literally just you like we can just observe patterns in the world and then figure out how to like send rockets to the moon <laughs> it's it is it is uncanny it and part of you does almost want to lead to the conclusion like well there's got to be something like underlying that that we've kind of like gotten in touch with which is like something which is transcendent but i don't know i don't know about that myself i mean there's something like you know the the slit experiment in quantum mechanics where they send electrons through the the slits and like um so like there's a sheet that's like a sensing where the electrons land and you fire the electrons through the slit. And even if you fire them one at a time, they always end up, uh, the result is like always the same pattern. Mm. Like you're like, so, so like it's, uh, I'm not explaining this probably because I'm not an expert in quantum mechanics, but <laughs> it, because the electrons should like form into a certain wave pattern when they're fired through these slits. And even if you fire them one at a time, they always produce the same pattern, which makes it seem like the electrons know where to go. And so if there are abstract laws that are determining how reality is formed, you know, that there's a certain parallel there, which is that the electrons, even though they're 
mo motion is supposed to be random. They're always producing these same wave patterns, like like there's some kind of abstract principle guiding them kind of thing. Yeah, definitely. I think quantum mechanics is fascinating just because it almost kind of brings science to a point where it can no longer reduce everything into discrete entities and discrete particulars where it's like, this is that thing and this this is all related in our kind of perfect world because effectively like what you're talking about there is, if I remember right, is it's like a probability distribution, isn't it? It's yeah. like they actually can understand, like the, the electron basically, because it's a wave particle duality, isn't it? Like the electron's not like a, a like a little ball and it's not like light, it's like this wave. It's like they're both actually the same thing. And the way they interact is it gets distributed through like a probability function, if I can remember right. Which is kind of crazy because that's basically saying that like the fundamental structure of reality as we know it accords by chance. It doesn't accord by like like a fixed thing that we can sort of, um, what was the word? Like determine with like 100% accuracy. So maybe that would even tie into like Nietzsche. Maybe Nietzsche would bring up quantum mechanics to basically say that like even science itself can't attain this being that we're so desperate for. As well, um, that means that you know how philosophy started off with like um, that Heraclitus first. I mean, first it was like Thales and stuff, but then it kind of went off into Heraclitus versus Parmenides when one said everything was being, everything was fixed, whilst the other said that you know everything is in constant flux. Um, yeah, I think quantum mechanics therefore could prove that Heraclitus was correct about flat um, properties. Yeah, I mean, maybe uh, I don't know whether I'd use the word prove, but certainly support. Mm -hmm. It's 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 just an it's another example of how our world as we know it is not so. Pardon me, it's not something we can ever look at, mm -hmm. and like, how should we say, like as much as I want to be able to look at this one thing and say, it's just that thing. And that's what it is. And it's like completely separate to everything around it. It, it literally isn't because even the particles that constitute this very thing in of themselves are not particles. It's literally like this constant flow of energy. That's just maintaining this, this structure. It's almost, I, I see it as this is what the Buddhists refer to as a veil of Maya, which is basically that like through perception, we are tricked into thinking that this world that we observe is composed of separate entities. We kind of misunderstand the true nature of reality through our very perception, because it's so easy for me to just like, look at this thing and like identify it as a phone or look at this and identify it as a guitar pick. And you can even do that with like people. It's, it's so easy for me to look at you and identify you as Aram and you as Harry and so on and so on and so on. But it's, it's basically like, like through perception, we can identify these particular entities, but that, that's not really what they, those things are. It does seem like there's a little contradiction in that when you talk about the Tao, it, it seems like you're a monist. Like you think that there's one kind of ontological substance, which is reality, which is kind of this flowing river. Mm. And in, in the essay, you talk about how uh, there's no eternal being and that it, everything's becoming but isn't this isn't the Tao the eternal being and that and that the Maya is the kind of patterns that appear within it that you know like the eternal flow but the, the being yeah. itself is eternal definitely and I think when I denounce being as a fiction in this essay it's very much in the context of Plato and that relationship between being and becoming exists because there's still nothing that I can point to that is fixed. So it's almost like a kind of, it's, I'm trying to think how to explain it. I know what you mean by that contradiction. It's a little bit like when you say something like all knowledge is subjective, that in of itself is an objective statement. And it's almost by virtue. It's, it's You're refuting platonic dual world idea where it's like there's two worlds. Yeah, because, well... Yeah, yeah, I am, because it's it doesn't really make any sense to me that there would be such a thing as a, a fixed, perfect world, because like, is, is, what is this world? Is it is it almost like a kind of, like you say, is it almost like code? And then this is just like the kind of chaos that ensues from that code. It's I, it, it just doesn't really make much sense to me. Like, where is it, I guess? I don't know. It's, I mean... See, even because I think one of the things here is that it's very much a lot of what we're talking about here 
and a lot of the issues that are arising out of what we're talking about completely arise out of language because effectively even the idea of a world that we live in is something that we've constructed out of language mm. like it's, it's a very abstract idea that we have that we live in a reality or a world that we kind of like is the same and then to to kind of further complicate that by postulating that there's like this other kind of world it's it opens up a whole can of worms like what is this world you first have to define this world before you can sort of say that there's another one if that makes any sense so what's the philosophy that you end up with if you abandon language i think the dao <laughs> maybe it's when you're fully present and i mean i know like this is something that's like a lot more prevalent in in some eastern philosophies such as buddhism and taoism because i know that i've heard i've heard stories before told by alan watts about people like young students who go to a monastery to study and they might they might say to their teacher like oh can you tell me about the nature of reality and their teacher will just go shh and they'll be like are you not going to tell me and they'll just shh they'll tell them to shut up again <laughs> and they'll be like what's up I heard a story where it was like the, the some guy came to his Zen master and he said to him, what's the nature of the eternal Buddha? And the guy said, pass me that chin rest. And the, the student passed him the chin rest and then he hit him on the forehead with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's all sorts of crazy stuff like that. Like there's another one where like somebody, yeah, is this similar sort of thing where it's like, can you tell me like the nature of, of the Buddha or reality? So they just chin them and they laugh and say, ah, you, you get it. <laughs> And I think what like these sort of stories are trying to say is a basically kind of it's almost like a redirection of sorts. It's almost like trying to divert your attention, because obviously, if you're trying to think if you're already in the mind of they're going to explain something with language and then they do something like just hit you, then you'll be like, well, what the fuck? That doesn't explain anything, but it actually does, mm -hmm. because it's trying to redirect your attention away from language back to how should we say experience? Like, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly that. Um, in a way, like, like I've had experiences, because, um, I mean, you two have probably had more, like, Buddhist experiences than I have, but um, I've, I've actually had some Buddhist experiences when I went to Japan one time, and I got an opportunity to, to like, stay in a monastery for a night. And, oh, really? Oh, that's Yeah, I did, yeah, fully, yeah, like. That's amazing. Just for one night, though, um, literally lived the whole way, like, you know, slept on tatami mats, um when at five o'clock in the morning to do buddhist rituals and mm. then so basically at night we did like you know a tour with the man or the mantras and stuff and at one point when they started singing like you know the mantras i, I just shut my eyes and then i realized you know i get it i mm. I, I finally get it you know like yeah and it's not about explaining it. it's not it's not like some lecturer explained a thirty-five thousand page thesis on the intricate nature of the universe it's just me and this mantra and just feeling it just getting it like and you can't really explain reality like now that i think about it you can't really explain it because like expl explanations in themselves are subjective you've just got to feel it yeah definitely that's yeah that's really nice that story actually because it, it really just kind of hints at what all like these great teachers have been saying for thousands of years is effectively just like like the world's already doing itself by itself. You don't need to worry about anything. Mm -hmm. This is it's this concept in Taoism called Zushan, which basically just means that which is itself. So, and it, it's funny because when you when you have to say a sentence which is that convoluted, it almost sounds like well, like well, what's what's the point in even having that sentence or that that term in the first place? But it's it's simply to just redirect you towards, like you say, that just feeling. Of just understanding like oh it's just it's doing itself it always has been so what would you say Aaron? what if you had to put into words what what it is that you felt did, did you feel like a sense of peace or did you what, what what is it exactly that you that you mean when you said that you you got it i mean um put one putting it into words would be anti-taoist anti-buddhist but um <laughs> but what i felt was um a sense of understanding kind of very much a sense of you know it wasn't really peace. It was a sense of just, you know, finally getting it. Like, it was yeah. more a sense of coming to some final truth. Mm. 
like it wasn't really peace because like you know there's more to explore and stuff like I wasn't finished exploring it's not like this is the final this is like the final truth like I was watching um an episode of the midnight gospel where I think Clancy he kind of has a realization like that and he just keeps saying oh I'm enlightened I'm enlightened mm. how to cut everything off and stuff like and he, he thinks he's like the smartest motherfucker in the room but what he doesn't realise is that off that enlightenment, there's still work to do. There's still, you know, exploration to do. So it's an understanding, but it was like, you know, not one final truth. It was more like, this. I'm going to be set on the right path now. I'm going to be set on the right path to getting, like, understanding truth, even if there's not one objective truth. If that makes any, if that makes that any sense. Mm. I do think... I'm I've become rather skeptical of the notion of enlightenment in recent like times though because I wonder what it means to be enlightened and you realize that like it's 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 literally no different to how you've always been like it's not like when you get enlightened you suddenly have the force and can like like bend shit with your mind it's just it's it's I it's I almost sort of think the point of enlightenment is that there is no such thing as enlightenment. And that's kind of the whole trick. Like the idea that you hold in your mind of like enlightenment as being the special thing. It's actually what refrain, like is what restrains you from ever being enlightened. <laughs> like, uh, Cause it's like you were saying before about how, if reality is an ocean, uh, reality is a river. Yeah. So there's no individual agents. So it's not like I'm moving my, this hand and you're moving that hand. It's just, one continuous river like mm. you were saying so wouldn't enlightenment be to feel that in your bones so that you didn't you lost all kind of differentiation between voluntary and involuntary action yeah definitely in fact let me let me just find something there's like this really interesting passage by uh Zhangzi. i don't know whether i'll be able to find it now so it would feel so because it's not that you, you know, like that's the way it already is according to that philosophy so that you would feel like something moved through you instead of you, instead of your actions originating with a separate self, you would feel Definitely. just like your hands were moving automatically. With the no, I, I, I can't find the thingy, um, the passage that I want to, but um, there's a passage by Zhang Zhou where he basically describes himself as like, walk like walking on wind or like being able to like be with the wind and being able to like walk on water and they're all like these really profound analogies about how essentially to basically truly liberate oneself is to basically be able to let go and completely feel yourself and understand yourself as the the the, the world around you like the the, the world like being itself mm. but i just think it's really interesting that analogy of being able to like go with the wind I've got one, I've got a quote like that that I can read. Oh, right. It's by this guy called Lietze, who is a Taoist, and it's mm. like him talking about his training with his master. I'll, I'll get it, I'll just be two seconds. Yeah, sure. But, um, as I was saying, in the meantime, that's kind of like presence in a way. Mm. Much about it. Like, you know, become present, just feeling at one with everything, just feeling, just present, just feeling in this world, kind of. like Definitely. Me like feeling like I'm doing a podcast right now with you, Sam, and you have it like just feeling very much there. Definitely. Because it's always it always amazes me like when you hear about it it seems to be a thing, particularly with artists. So it might be like actors or musicians or whatnot, where they talk about getting in the zone. Where like if you ask like a lot of great artists how they produce such great art, they they'll say to themselves, I, I don't even know, I, j- I just did it. <laughs> Like, I know Ayrton Senna, the, like, he was a really famous racing driver, uh, F1 driver from the, like, mid-80s to the mid-90s. It, he, he was phenomenally talented. He's arguably, like, the best who ever did it. And there's a there's a street circuit in um, F1 called Monaco. So it's basically, it's just, like, a race around, like, the streets of Monaco. And so because of that, it's, the like, the walls are, like, right there. So it's, like, incredibly difficult. It's, like, it takes tremendous concentration. And Ayrton Senna basically out-qualified his teammate by, like, over a second, which in F1 is just, like, like a light year. That's just, like, an insane amount of time to out-qualify somebody by. And when talking about the lap, he said he realized when he was doing the lap that he was no longer conscious 
that it was just it was like he said he describes it as like going down this tunnel and he just keep he keeps pushing and pushing and pushing further down this tunnel and i just like when i heard that i was like just like that just kind of almost reaffirms to me that like all like these Taoist philosophies that i read like they're not just like woo they're actually they're more profound than anything else you could ever read because it's just so obvious that like this is something that is like really true to the human experience that like like somebody who's like just done like somebody who's basically outperformed their own body it's because they they weren't their body they were literally finding the spot and just toying with it <laughs> and it's, it's really just yeah it's it's mad when you say not conscious though you, you don't mean that he had no experience you mean that he was like not like reflecting on his experience and saying like oh this and that and making decisions it was just became automatic like when you drive a car and you and you like get back to your house and you and you can't remember driving there kind of thing it's like it's not that you weren't having the experience it was just that it wasn't like it was just became kind of automatic kind of thing. He, he didn't attribute it to himself it wasn't him driving the car it was doing itself by itself mm. like that concept i said before the, of zuzhan of itself so it's just something that does itself because it is itself which like the heartbeat yeah exactly exactly like the heartbeat yeah like so the, the whole body is just like this continual process which just does itself by itself so the aim of Taoism is to relegate those things that are usually very conscious and very reflective relegate them to a more kind of automatic uh of itself process kind of thing yeah because i think Essentially, because this is something I like I that Alan Watts has talked about is he says like you cannot never be present, you cannot never be just the thing itself doing itself. So it's it's almost just basically kind of like having to like you, you kind of and I know it sounds a little bit dramatic, but you basically do live a lie of sorts when you got caught up in your own bullshit. You basically are just living a lie. You're just completely forgetting that, like, oh, it's like I'm just this world doing itself is nothing to really worry about because like all my worries are basically just kind of like, well, they, they, they they're not really real <laughs> in mm. some sense, but yeah, like I think what you were saying about relegating away from. And it's of, always been that way because, you know, even when you thought of yourself as being an individual person, you were still just the universe as an, as a whole, you know, doing its own thing kind of thing. Exactly. That's exactly it. It's like you said about how you'd become disillusioned with enlightenment because it's not like there's some kind of dramatic shift. Yeah. Because it really, it was always that way, you know, and, and the, the sense of individuality of you being an individual agent was always just a kind of illusion. Exactly. And I think what happens is you have moments of enlightenment and then maybe moments of, I don't know, like being absorbed in the ego self, but it's it's basically like... I feel like everybody just has moments in their life where they are just basically they, they fully understand that they're like just this world doing itself, whether it be like through painting a picture or like, like even people like, um, like footballers or like, like athletes definitely can understand that feeling. It's pure liberation. That's, that's probably why they enjoy doing it so much because it's, it's, it, it takes them out of their own mind and they almost kind of like toy with the Tao. <laughs> mm. You know, um, with the whole like toying with the Tao thing, like the whole trying to like you know put it all into a framework. Um, mm. Isn't that just the problem with overthinking? Isn't that why overthinking causes so much anxiety, like just so much awkwardness because it's not a natural state of being, and you constantly think yeah. about oh, what will happen if I do this. This will lead to certain traps. This will you know lead to this, which will lead to this, which will lead to this. Like mm. in essence, isn't you know going away from being present. The source of most anxiety yeah no i i 100 agree with that because it's it's the, the problem isn't thoughts themselves because the thoughts just kind of arise into your head naturally but the problem was when you you stop identifying with reality itself and start basically focusing in on those thoughts basically focusing inwards instead of outwards i've been watching a lot of star wars recently and um they like they talk about like how like the Jedi are, are completely selfless and focus outwards and the Sith focus like inwards. So there's like a you can even say there's like a cheeky moral dimension to like focusing fully inwards is you'll end up like a Sith Lord. 
But um, I'm not sure about the Jedi, you know, as I get older, it seems a little bit more more and more fishy, you know? Yeah, <clears throat> I know exactly. Even the kids, like when they're dead young and brainwashing them and stuff and, you know, disengaging from the emotions and all that. Well, you know, you know what? Funnily enough, that's basically what, like, like a lot of Buddhist institutions have done throughout history as well, it, which, because I know Alan Watts talks about this, where he basically says that, like, what Buddhism basically ended up becoming throughout the history of China was basically just a place where parents sent their naughty boys to become disciplined and it kind of lost its initial mystical edge of like trying to basically just appreciate life as it is, if that makes any sense. But yeah. Can you argue therefore that Buddhism can lend itself very handily to like cults? So definitely. Well, it's a religion. And I think I think religion is fundamentally problematic in so far as it basically tells you that like you can attain liberation as long as you follow our rules. And again, it's to relate it back to the Nietzsche essay, it's kind of like this idea that like there is this fixed narrative that you can follow, which will lead you to this end point, which is just simply absurd. It's just not how the world works. It's the it's you have to do almost the entire complete opposite, which is to abandon those sentiments entirely. Mm. Again, on the whole thing of Star Wars, like there's a great quote by Yoda where he says, like, let go of the thing that you fear to lose, like the most, and then you will be happy. Which I think is a very good quote. Isn't that kind of inhuman? It is, to be honest, I think. I think there is a reason why, and this is related back to what I was saying about being disillusioned with the idea of like attaining enlightenment is it it sounds really bloody hard to get to that sort of state of mind where you can just basically just like let go of like needing family or friends or food or like anything basically. Cause like, like some enlightened, like sort of realized beings, if you, if you were next to them, they probably like, they probably would literally be like, a stick insect just sitting there but they would just have like they would just be so like present that they would probably have like an unbelievable amount of like superhuman strength but it's just it is effort to get to that point that's why I, the way i see life at the moment is i kind of see it as like i i'm really interested in Taoism and all like the lessons it can teach me but i'm still gonna basically pretend to be some if that makes any sense there's still a kind of fun in playing the game of being a, a person in the world, if that makes any sense. I don't know, like the reason why I quite like Taoism is because I, I always thought of it as getting past that kind of um, uh, that superhuman vision of like the old and enlightened guru where because in India and um, and where Buddhism originated, there's always this idea of like guruhood where there's these kind of super beings or whatever whereas the Tao always seemed to me very kind of earthy where it was yeah, like... no it's um i've got to find something now because there's this book i've um it's called like Tao: the water called way by alan watts where he talks about like this book is focused pardon me is focused mainly on basically contemplative Taoism, which is what you're talking about there which is kind of like without the supernatural edge so there is such a thing as um, I don't know how to pronounce this. It, it's spelled H S I E N. I think it's like Xi'an Taoism, Xi'an, something like that. Um, that that's where it starts to be like about like how you use Taoism to gain like supernatural like powers. But again, like what is this supernatural that like they speak of? It's just it it's just a linguistic. How should we say? It's like a linguistic fallacy. It seems to me contradictory to what you were saying before, because what you were saying before is that reality is a, a river. And so every, every, all actions originate from a single source. Which, like, So for instance, it's not that I'm moving this hand and you're moving that hand. It's just that reality is a river. And yeah. all everything that moves, that both our hands are just patterns in the river. Yeah. So if you say that there's a guru who has these incredible powers and stuff, well, who has the incredible powers, you know, because... Yeah, you know, the, the guru moving his hand and me moving my hand is originating from the same source, you know, and that's yeah, why no. I like Taoism because it it removes that kind of boundaries between individual agents. No, I, I 100% agree with that. I think it is effectively just it's almost like it's very um, Zen in spirit Taoism and in as much as it basically just tries to how should we say it tries to make reality less complicated. It just tries to bring it back 
to the source, just tries to bring it back to what it is, which is, it's just really simple and peaceful. Like if you go for a walk, like, like on a sunny day in, in like the woods, you'll, you will feel that feeling of just like, ah, oh, it's nothing to worry about. It's just, everything's fine. Cause that's that, that's that feeling of just like bringing it back to what the thing is and like not focusing on inside like the internal mind so much or like 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 what's in here um i think we've done nearly an hour do you want to bring it to a conclusion shall we yeah sure um read nietzsche and read thousand yeah the... plug in nietzsche yeah you know what the reason why i really like nietzsche is because I think he's one of the very few philosophers in like the Western tradition who kind of understands that like there's literally no point in talking about philosophy in a really broken down like you were saying before I remember like, like how like you can't explain things like using like for, like like 700 page books that like go on and on and on because Nietzsche just basically just like like a lot of it is just basically like poetic and like really quite funny which reminds me a lot of like sort of Taoist texts that I read, which just like normally just crack me up because some of the stuff that they talk about is just really, really interesting. But through using humor and through sort of playing with your emotions, it actually gets more at the profundity of what it's trying to say than if it like listed it out. And I remembered more words and concepts. But yeah. You want to de-intellectualize philosophy. Sorry, Aram, I interrupted you. What were you going to say? I was just saying one more thing is that um, if you do read Nietzsche, Try not to misread him. Try not to be one of those like edgy fifteen-year-olds who, like, oh, um, I hate my mom. I hate my parents. Nietzsche is this philosopher who will liberate me from. Yeah, bastard parents. Don't be like yeah, that. Definitely. And you also got to be careful with the misogyny in Nietzsche. That's the one thing I don't like about Nietzsche. Is he is quite like he is a bit of a misogynist. It's because he couldn't get any, and he was clearly just really like a bit like salty about it. So he just kind of like said like, "Oh, women are just like too complicated and up their own asses, aren't they?" But, yeah. Well, that's a good point to conclude. <laughs> <laughs>